First, it can be useful to, to give you some insight into what Tails is and where the project is at right now and how we see our relationship with Upstream and especially with Debian. So, what's Tails? Tails is the amnesic incognito live system. That is, it's a live operating system. You can boot it on almost any x86 computer. You can boot it from DVD, USB sticks, SD cards, and it's based on Debian, of course. Its main goals are to preserve its users' anonymity and privacy. Uh, this goes in many ways. So, first of all, um, all outgoing connections to the internet are routed for the Tor network, which provides some reasonable level of anonymity and censorship circumvention features. The other main feature of Tails is that it's amnesic. That is, unless you do something special, everything that you've done using Tails will be forgotten when you shut the laptop off. But it's not only about internet and amnesia. It's also about allowing people to use the internet in a safer way for example, we ship a lot of desktop cryptographic tools to encrypt instant messaging, email, files, whatever. Some people also use Tails to produce documents, to do media production. Some people use Tails to write books, to make movies, to edit radio shows, stuff like that. We see usability as a security feature because even if maybe you have the technical means to protect yourself by configuring your systems in various ways, maybe it's not the case for everyone. And I see privacy and security as collective matters, especially when com communication is involved. So it's not enough to that tech-savvy people are able to harden their systems and configure them for better privacy and security. Because if the less tech-savvy users can't use our stuff, and our stuff is not only Tails, it's any tool that pretends to provide some level of anonymity, privacy, whatever, then they'll use something worse. And collectively, it will be worse for everyone. Um, the first public Tails release was put out in 2009, so it's, wow, five years now. Yeah. It's, the software we ship is translated in many languages. It's free software, it's public and open development. We have Git, Redmine, mailing lists, monthly public meetings, what, uh, all these things. And we try to to document quite well what we are trying to do and how, thanks to our design documentation. So, now, does it work? Apparently, yes, according to the NSA, at least. <laughs> and I'd like to thank a famous tail user for providing these documents. <laughs> it's called Edward S. And some other more or less famous people apparently have good things to say about Tails, so I'll trust them on that. Our, our user base is quite broad and diverse. We don't really know much about most of our users for quite obvious reasons. But we, are at l we know some things. We hear from users we meet in various places. And we hear from groups that are distributing tales, promoting tales, teaching people how to use tales. So, yeah, we know like activists use tales, journalists use tales, at least the ones that went through some training and have some idea of what they are dealing with. That is, a few. Um, before going to the next part of my introduction, which is what where the project is at right now and what the challenge, what are the challenges we are facing, I'd like to ask if you have questions about 
just what tails the software is. Anyone? How do you, given the security focus here, how do you... Given the security focus you have here, how do you balance security updates versus anonymity of users? Do you have automatic security updates or do you expect the users to manually be aware of that stuff? I'll come I'll come to the release cycle soon, but we basically release every six weeks and there's an automatic easy way to say yes I want to upgrade. But it's a live system, we don't do upgrades with apt. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, let's move forward. So, Tails is an operating system that releases quite often. To prepare a release, currently it still takes between 6 and 10 solid days of work, which is a lot. Especially once you realize that we release every six weeks and sh we ship an release candidate most of the times a week or two before the actual release. So that's six to ten days of work every three weeks actually. Enjoy. Also, some, a lot of people seem to be using Tails and the, the numbers are growing up. So in July you had about 11 and a half uh, thousand boots of tails a day connected to the internet. And this... Yes, that's kind of an obvious question. Yeah, right? yeah. Usual, the usual one. So um, a startup after successfully connecting to the internet, uh, tails connects for Tor to retrieve an atom feed that contains information about the, the, the known security issues available great. So it does call home in the mm, cleanest way we could find because it seems important to be able to warn users that they are using an outdated version that has security issues. So we can grab the web server's access logs for this item feed and count. We don't manage the server, <laughs> but I think it's a few weeks, something like that. There are no IPs in these logs, and the connections are over Tor, so well. all that you can learn from this is someone started Tails at this time. It's not much. So, and uh, same in July, we had 35,000 downloads of the OpenPGP detached ISO signature which means probably at least 30, 35,000 ISO downloads and probably many more because most users don't really check the signature because, you know, OpenPGP sucks. <laughs> um, these numbers tend to go higher and higher every day. Uh, the number of boots a day has doubled between last October and July, for example. And it's not just the Snowden effect, because it's been doubling every 6 to 12 months since years, actually. This tends to increase the kind of expectations people have about Tails, which puts more and more pressure on the people who actually make Tails. But well, for now, we are good. Mm, the team is quite small. We are working mostly on a volunteer basis. It might, the ratio might change a bit in the next years, but it's un still unclear. And well, you can say that about a dozen people spend at least a day a month on Tails, and uh, about four people spend at least one or two days a week on Tails, to give you an idea. Now, what are we up to? One thing we've been working on quite hard since two years is to make it clear that we need more diverse contributions. 
with, from people with more diverse skills. That is, we need UX experts, graphic designers, translators, tech <coughs> writers, many more kind of skills that when you get in the usual free software project. Because tales about uh, usability, remember? We've also tried to welcome contributions from more diverse people. Our main goals for the next few years is to make the project more sustainable. As I said, putting out a release is exhausting and we are, we are very, very good at working like hell, but this can't work forever this way. And it might be better if we spend these days to do more useful things, actually. So this is about continuous integration, automated testing, infrastructure improvement, things like that. If Puppet Jenkins automated test sounds good to your ear, come talk to me. We also have an ongoing project of improving Tails usability, thanks to Zach, who met us meet some great UX experts. We are doing some usability testing sessions, testing prototypes, trying to improve things a bit. With from a quite global point of view, that includes the website, first time user experience, installation, usage. And the, given the tales getting more and more known as a store, it seems that it's also becoming a more and more interesting target for people or entities who <coughs> might want to know a bit more about Tails users. So it's also one of our priorities to make Tails more secure, to mitigate the effects of security holes in the software ship. So we're also working on hardening and sandboxing. Any questions on this part? I have a question about development process. I have a qu Tails development process. I'm not sure where it fits, but um, how do you protect Tails itself against targeted attacks? I mean, uh, it's fine to say that you have it's open source, right? But this is clearly. Well, I don't know. To me, it doesn't seem like enough. So I wonder if this is a, a project issue. Like, uh, are you taking extra care with your Git repositories and signing commits or anything, any sort of uh, things like that? We're not signing commits, but basically everything that goes into Tails gets peer reviewed before it's merged. The people who have commit access have to follow some uh, quite strict security policy regarding their data and systems. And, well, it's mm, our answer to that is more social and organizational than technical, actually, I think. I, I would be curious to hear what the requirements are. Um, <coughs> as a new member of Keyring Mate, I'd be curious to hear what your requirements are for contributors. Um, not because I expect to be able to enforce anything in Debian, but I'd be curious to hear what sort of standards we should be asking people to try to follow. Shall I answer that now, or should we talk about it later? No? Well, uh, it's not exactly public information. Um, <laughs> uh, we can talk about it later. later. Anyway, we came up with security policy just by doing basic threat modeling and so looking, okay, what's the easiest way for an attacker to put Tails user at risk, uh, throw via people who have commit access, and then you say, okay, this is a problem, let's make sure this is fixed, and this is another problem, and, and your rate and rate. Nothing special. I'm, wonder <coughs> I'm wondering what kind of privacy issues um, and security issues you found in Debian itself that you've had to patch? Mm, that would be more a question for the next part, but, well... Nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
I don't remember exactly. But well, yeah, we we do report bugs, including security or priority ones, of course. <laughs> Any other question before I dive into the Tails upstream relationship topic? Okay, let's go. So, in our area, in the privacy anonymity focused distributions, most projects have lived one to two years max for various reasons that I won't go into now. So, from the very beginning of this project, we've taken a quite hard stance on maintainability and trying to keep our delta as small as possible in order not to build an ever-growing technical depth and things we have to, we'll have to maintain ourselves forever. I'll give a very quite quickly a few examples of about this. So, for example, there are things we'd like to have but we didn't do ourselves internally because we don't think it's reasonable to add this kind of maintenance workload to, to, the, and to the shoulders of the TACE project itself, like having a GRSEC patch kernel. This should be done in Debian instead. Same goes for the compile tight hardening flags. It's Many people ask us, do you rebuild the, the Debian packages you ship to harden them more? And well, the answer is no. When we want some software to be more hardened, we have it hardened in Debian itself. There are examples of what we shouldn't have done this way. There are features like we have a fancy OpenPGP applet that's quite useful for many use cases, and this should be packaged. And actually it's been packaged. So it should <coughs> hopefully be uploaded in time for JC and otherwise no big deal we have backports. Same for the <coughs> tails. When you when you shut down tails, it erases memory to protect against basically call boot attacks. This also would be worth having in Debian. I want to have that on my regular Debian system. The packaging Test, test. Okay, nice. let's go. So for... Yeah, put it on. Put it on your... Mm. <coughs> Does it work? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, test, test. Okay? No, not. <coughs> no. No. Just work. Just work. Try again? Test, test. Yeah, it's <laughs> So, um, um, this, this feature is being packaged. We have a working a package that works fine with CZ in it, but uh, it uses KXEC and systemd has a <coughs> another way to deal with KXEC that mm, we should adapt our stuff to, to work with it. There are various examples of what we can boast about, uh, stuff we've been doing upstream, we've been contributing to Aparmore upstream, to Libvert, Seahorse, various things in Debian, things like that. Zach will be better to tell you about how great we are. The consequences of this um, project direction is that we have very little tail-specific code. 
what we do is gluing things together. It's a bit like the, the way the Freedom Box project sees itself. A bit less radical, a bit more usable maybe. Um, and we do a lot of social work, like talking to upstreams, making them aware of our needs, um, finding the right people to do the right work at the right place, things like that. These days I spend personally much more time doing this kind of social work than actually hacking on tails. One another consequence of this stance is that we we're quite slow. And well when we are improving something in Debian, we might not benefit from it before two years or more, depending how fast and how fast we are to uh, rebase tails on top of the latest stable release, which we suck at, kind of. <laughs> and another consequence of this choice is that tail is still alive. Yay. Which I think we can be quite proud of. Yeah. I also have to say that it's often frustrating for new contributors who are very enthusiastic about hey <coughs> I want to change this change this in Tails and then yeah this would be good but maybe we don't want to maintain it ourselves forever maybe it instead it should go somewhere else and so it makes the barrier higher and yeah it's hard but we'll discuss a bit later how this can be improved at least as far as Debian is concerned As I said, Tails is based on Debian, and Tails re relies very heavily on Debian. On the project, the infrastructure, the social processes, the individuals. So, first, I'd like to reaffirm <coughs> that Tails is really, uh, Debian is really, really good basis for derivatives. And I'd like to thank everyone who makes this real every day. I could make a list of the various teams and individuals who are helping and particularly, but well, it would be too, too long and I would forget too many people. <laughs> You're probably all <coughs> included in some way. <laughs> so I'd li I'll go quickly on a few ways that Debian could help Tails better or the ways that in that you as Debian contributors could give a hand to Tails by working in Debian itself. We always have many one-shot small tasks that can give a hand, like uploading a backport and maintaining it. It's not a one-shot actually. <coughs> um, <laughs> we have a few user tag bugs in the Debian BTS. <coughs> so it's Are you able to spend one hour every three months that will be one less hour I have to do things about this. Okay. And I can focus on test specific things. You lost the microphone in my microphone. Yeah. Yeah. What should I do? Um, well, the other try the other mic. Try the I think you replaced the batteries. You just burn them up. <laughs> test. Yeah, it is the NSA. <laughs> what, the remote control interface in this thing? <laughs> So yeah, it's really possible to, to give a hand just by ask me and I'll find something for you. As well. Another way to, try to help us help Debian and make Tails and Debian stronger is to help us help Debian, is to mentor and sponsor contributions from Tails contributors who are getting involved in Debian. Um, it wasn't the case a year ago. <coughs> really, a year ago, the, the main person, the main Tails contributor who was contributing to Debian directly was me. And in August, I've had a look and we had five Tails contributors who had stuff uploaded to the archive. This could be, this was sometimes NMU, sometimes packages that are maintaining since a few months, things like that. So things are changing pretty fast in this area and I think it's a really good outcome. And there will be more. But these are new contributors and they need to
to be helped. They need to be mentored, pointed to the right documentation, and their packages need to be sponsored. We already have a few people who are in this room and that I would like to warmly thank. We do this kind of work and we will need we need more too. <coughs> if you have more time a great way to, to help Tails is to improve Debian globally, like with adding a Palmer support or improving it with working with unreproducible builds, improving hardening build flags coverage, and maybe making the default set of flags a bit st stricter on architect architectures that can hold it, like PIE. Um, where we <coughs> need a lot of packages to be in good shape and to be improved. I, there are a few examples. We need a GRSec kernel. We have teams about anonymity tools, about OTR that you are wa warmly, warmly <coughs> welcome to join. It would be good to have XR running as a net root. It would be good to have Wayland. It would be good to have systemd user sessions. And many more things. It would be good if there were a few improvements made under the relative patches tracking tools. This has been discussed recently in the Debian Derivatives mailing list. If you're looking for some smallish coding task, that might be for you. More to come at the Derivatives buff. Also, we and Debian continuous integration things uh, move forward quite fast these days because possibly at some point we'd like to base tails on Debian testing or at least quarterly snapshots of thereof, something like that. And yeah. So if you're <laughs> interested in giving a hand to tails by working on Debian, we have a, a page on our website that sums it up and gives pointers contribute slash how slash Debian and now I'd like to discuss with you how Tails can m help Debian in some way or be a better citizen in the Debian community the mic is yours mm -hmm. So <coughs> um, I think that actually Debian, I think Tails is doing a great service for Debian um, in terms of providing a, I know this sounds a little bit strange, but in some ways a more visible um, distribution uh, than Debian is. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean Debian is sort of in the background and there are systems administrators who know about it and use it reliably. Um, but um, working for an organization that cares about civil liberties and privacy um, and freedom of speech tales is uh, is known as one of the t one of the tools that we should be using and uh, we've used it in <coughs> in my work and uh, I have colleagues who have probably never run a Linux system except for tails so um, thanks for raising the profile there I think tails also provides an example of how we can improve Debian for privacy and security conscious people and we need that because we don't often have people who agree with that and I think it's uh, helpful for us to have direction to go in. So on the user experience side, uh, I observe that Tails is putting a lot of effort into making uh, things very polished for <coughs> end users, and that seems like the sort of thing that uh, we ought to be aiming for in our broader distro as well. Uh, so perhaps just the knowledge of what things do real users actually hit, uh, these usability studies, I think they would be very very helpful to have all the issues fixed upstream as well. Yeah, actually, once we 
we have completed the first large iteration of our usability work. I'd like to point the UX experts we are working with to, for example, the DI. There's a bit of room for improvement there. Well, if people developing DI are interested in this and ready to prepare prototypes, implement suggestions <laughs> and stuff like that, of course. What sorts of uh, tools would help us iterate more quickly on these sorts of ideas? Uh, I, I suspect that most developers don't do a whole lot of user experience mock-up testing uh, before they write their code. They probably focus on how do I make the thing work and then turn it from a raw API into something that you can like get keystrokes into. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on how we can make building usable software either more interesting or more well-tooled or...? Well, I think the main thing on this topic is uh, humility. That as software developers, we really have to realize that UX and G UI design is really some other kind of job that we generally are not good at. And once you've realized that, it's not so hard to find the right people who have the right skills and they want to work with you. But yeah, and it intuition doesn't work great in this area. It's just like for optimization. W what you would guess that users will have problems about when you do some actual usability testing sessions, you realize that may or you are totally wrong actually. <coughs> so one of the things that tells you right now that I miss on my Debian system is the MAC address randomization. Uh, how much can we get that to uh, more Debian systems? I, is it it's unclear like who who should be talked to to make that happen or which upstream to pressure or I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, th that's a really hard question. If you this is the kind of thing that if you want to make any guarantees about. It really depends on a lot, a lot of other packages, how they interact with each other, and this kind of thing that you can't make guarantees in a quite specific system like Tails, but it's very hard to guarantee that some behavior will be preserved, whatever combination of among our many thousands of packages you install. Um, I submitted a bug against Network Manager asking for that. Oh. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Apparently we both submitted the same bug to Network Manager. Um, I, I do think the Network Manager right now is the right place to merge them, and then System D is Network D um, is the other place. And uh, we need more people to follow up on those bugs and say, yes, these are important. And if we could, it would be great to have someone follow up on the bug with a batch. Uh, because actually it looks to me like with the patch that I submitted, they were willing to consider it, but there are um, some difficult and awkward questions for non-ephemeral distributions about <coughs> uh, MAC address randomization. Uh, so there's logistical things that need to be sorted out to make that work. On that front, Apple has um, set up random MAC address during the scanning phase of Wi-Fi connection and afterwards it reverts to the normal MAC address. So that's a data point from the proprietary world where they're doing better than us. Um, <coughs> I think you're right that this is quite difficult because there are a lot of components uh, involved. Um, and it reminds me of the uh, question about uh, log 
uh, minimization that for basically a decade I was pushing on this at various points and making patches for syslogs and it was quite hard and then we had this session here at DevConf and suddenly everybody was fine with it and now <laughs> uh, <laughs> it seems we should uh, well yeah basically uh, you doing a session on something like that or uh, bringing it up in, at DevConf helps uh, hit a lot of the different points that need to be tweaked or at least seeds it in a lot of people's minds who are uh, responsible for the different packages or in different areas of Debian um, so uh, <coughs> As a one-person effort, it might be overwhelmingly difficult, but I think it could be possible. It does make me also wonder uh, about other nice features in Tails that somehow, what, uh, how can we get those <coughs> into Debian so people could have them by, I don't know, installing a package or something just to set up the uh, IP tables rules to route everything over Tor, or simple things like that, that could be turned into <laughs> simple <laughs> things. Well, I've uh, already considered, for example, packaging our Torrified DNS thing, but well, there are so many packages that want to touch result.conf and how it's configured, that it's really hard to convey to actual users that, okay, you can install this package and probably it will achieve this result. And possibly it will achieve this result right now, you can test it and confirm it, but it's very hard to convey the message that this might be broken by any upgrade in the future. It's not a great invariant. <laughs> Yeah, well one thing in the in the security and privacy landscape that's very important is to be able to convey to users what kind of expectation they can have. And in this kind of things that are touching aspects of the system that many packages are competing to affect in some way, like in the firewall configuration and or resolve resolver configuration, it's very hard. So we could still have something that does the right thing most of the time, but n now the question is how do you tell people about it, how do you <coughs> suggest them to install this package saying, okay, it will pr probably make things better, but maybe not. That's more a documentation and uh, communication to users question than technical one actually, I think. Uh, on the firewall part, I, I'd like to say that again, it's a terrible idea to make everything on a system go through Tor. You, you, it, you should not do that because uh, they will leak sensitive data. If you don't properly audit or like configure them before telling them use Tor, then usually it doesn't work the way you want. Um, one, one thing that at some um, but so for example, on Android platform, uh, someone uh, wrote an application, it's called Orwell, and where you can selectively select which application you want uh, to go through Tor and block all of us from the network. And it's a very good UI, uh, but it's very, it's super hard to achieve on, on it's, it's easy to achieve on an Android system because each application gets their own user ID, so you can use that to filter. But um, I thought about trying to make the same thing for, for a usual Delipsy Debian system, and I was like, uh, I don't know. So if you have a good idea, because I think that's a really, really good uh, user interface. The, um, the GNOME community is looking at sandboxing applications, and that could be totally part of that. I believe it uses container stuff, <laughs> but I'm not sure. One in the back. As, as an advanced user using Debian for <coughs> seven, eight years, I, I was very glad to be able to install tours, uh, Tails very quickly. And uh, my only disappointment was that the language that introduced what I could expect when I started it required my background. 
to understand. So if it was, if the language that introduced it says, hi, smiley face, <laughs> welcome to this. If you would like to know more about how this works, click here. Otherwise, enjoy your experience. Here's the browser. You know? <laughs> and then more people who do not have serious uh, security concerns could be filling the networks with their random noise and uh, it could be made more easy and uh, it's not as targetable as, uh, oh, this is a secret you know, group of people using this. Yeah? Um, I don't know if you saw the SystemD talk. Um, so um, Josh Triplett announced, basically described a number of features of SystemD and one of them in particular <coughs> was the idea of um, unmounting everything at the end and reverting entirely to an initial MFS. Um, and that strikes me as a very good opportunity and a very good place to do a memory scrub. Um, so as someone who runs with a lot of encrypted disks all the time, I know that, I, including my root volume, um, one of the things that bothers me is that when my machine shuts down, it hasn't unmounted root, because it, which means that it hasn't, un, it hasn't dropped the DM crypt mapping, which means that probably there's a chunk of memory that you know, still has my, uh, the master key for the volume. So I would really like to see that part get upstreamed, if possible. Uh, how long does it, the memory wipe usually take on a random laptop? Sorry? How long does the memory wipe take on a random laptop?